Nämme hinu i kyrkoi. No mang eh komanga tauteri te manga. I come from the mountain that's called Manga Tauteri. Ko Waiho te awa. I come from the river that's called Waiho. Ko Nati Pakeha te iwi. I come from the tribe that's called Nati Pakeha. No Aotearoa aho. I'm from the land of the long white cloud. Namahi nui. Kia koto. Thank you very much for having me here. My name, as uh, you know, is Mary Ann Elliott, and um, I am indeed here to talk about. Oh, that's my old one. Never mind. <laughs> that's not, That's the old one. We'll go with this one. <laughs> when practice isn't enough, um, <laughs> it seems to be the, <laughs> the conference for it. <laughs> The conference for the, the different slides to the ones that you thought you were going to get, but that's all right. I am here to talk about when practice isn't enough, and so I guess the first question is, when practice isn't enough for what, right? Well, when practice isn't enough for the path or the vow that I'm personally committed to, which is the vow to end suffering of all beings. So practice is um, where I start but it's not where I end. And I wanted to start this talk off a little bit by touching into what is that suffering? What is the suffering of all beings? What is the, the soup that we're swimming in? What's the context that we're practicing in, that we're living in, uh, and that we're engaging in? And uh, as Bernie Glassman recently said, the Buddhist life or the Buddhist, the engaged Buddhist life is a life at the cracks. It's a life where we engage at the cracks of society. But those cracks have um, continued throughout human history and particularly recently in many ways to become not only deeper but wider and many more people are falling through them. So these are just a few um, places of suffering, a few cracks in our society. They're the ones that touch me most deeply. There'll be different ones that touch you. The first one that touches me very much is incarceration, perhaps because I've committed my own life to liberation and also because I think that there's probably very little that symbolizes separation, the way that we understand other people to be apart from us, that the problem somehow is other than us. There's very little that, um, that demonstrates that more clearly than incarceration. And you may know that there's no country in the world that proportionately incarcerates more of its citizens than this country. There are currently more than two million people behind bars in America. And I don't know how well you can see that photo, but gives you a sense of some of the conditions under which those people are incarcerated. But it's not just the number of people who are incarcerated that touches me, it's also who's incarcerated. And this is equally true in my own country. So I'm, I'm giving you statistics from your country because I'm, I'm guessing that that's going to be relevant to you, but this is equally true in New Zealand. Uh, and this is from a, a research um, report called Invisible Men by Becky Petit where she found that over 37% of young black men who dropped out of school were um, incarcerated. And I don't know um, if there has been similar research done here, but in New Zealand, research was done on the percentage of people in our jails and our prisons who have learning disorders, who have hearing impairments, and who therefore had very obvious problems in the education system. And you've probably heard of what's referred to as the school to prison, prison pipeline, which is a, a kind of a fast track that a lot of young people in New Zealand are on and a lot of young people here in your own country are on too. And it involves enormous amounts of suffering, not only for those who are incarcerated, but for their families uh, and their, their communities. Another um, place of suffering that touches me very closely because I've served alongside so many uh, military personnel in Afghanistan and other places is the fact that in, in the United States, every 65 minutes, so that's almost one an hour on average, one US military veteran takes their own life. It's really extraordinary. It's, um, it's deeply, deeply heartbreaking and... Um, what it, what it adds up to is that in 2012, more military personnel lost their lives to suicide, took their own lives, than were killed in active combat duty. 
And this is clearly connected to what um, Rick was talking about last night. It's clearly connected to patterns that get set up in your brain when you're repeatedly exposed to pain and suffering. But it's also connected to um, the fact that, as um, one of our great Zen peacekeeper, um, Zen peacemaker teachers said, the system stinks. The system stinks. This is, this is beyond the neuroplasticity of the brain. The suffering is also caused by a system that stinks. Uh, something that's close to me as well, because I have personal experience of it, is the incredibly high rates of anxiety-related disorders and depression. Um, in a recent um, piece of research carried out here in the United States, one in 10 American adults reported symptoms that would add up to a diagnosis of current depression. This is not lifetime experience. One in 10 is currently self-reporting symptoms of depression. Again, clearly related to the, uh, the neurobiology that we were talking about last night, but also we know linked to systemic issues, including poverty. Um, and speaking of poverty, the system stinks. <laughs> 46 million Americans are living below what is officially recognized as the poverty line. And it's not just that some people are poor, it's that as rich people keep getting richer, poor people in this country keep getting poorer. This is a quote from a man called Joe Gantz, who made a documentary, which I recommend to you all, called American Winter. Uh, and I'm going to read it to you. There are two separate countries in America. One struggling day to day to pay for their electricity, heat, rent and food, and the other doing well, and not tuned in to those who are suffering right among them. And to me, this really speaks to the Buddhist path and the Buddhist vow that um, our practice will help us see, but then what? What then what? And uh, it's not just here, obviously. I've uh, worked most of my career internationally, and um, this number I find really hard to actually compute, that 1.4 billion people in the world are living in extreme poverty, which means living on less than $1.25 a day. Uh, and that's such a, such a big number that I really find it difficult to do anything with it in my brain. This is a number that um, resonates in many ways for me more clearly and more heartbreakingly, which is that 22,000 children die every day. 22,000 children die every day due to poverty-related causes. And as UNICEF points out, again, we're not, we don't see them. Maybe we see them from time to time on an advertisement, but the, the, the extent to which separation has been entrenched in our system and in our society is the extent to which this is allowed and able to carry on. Uh, 70% of women globally will experience personally violence in their lifetime. And if we think about those three basic needs that Rick talked about last night, the need for safety, the need uh, for, our, for our basic needs to be met, the satisfaction or the nourishment of our basic needs, and the need for connection, 70% of women at some point in their life are not going to be able to get past the first one because they're not safe. They're not safe. And it's not just humans who are suffering. An area the size of Costa Rica is destroyed every year of what? Of the lungs of the planet, of our forests. And I don't know about you, but if I think about this one too, too long, I really feel my heart starts to break. Um, particularly because I have a personal history with this. My ancestors moved to New Zealand um, from Scandinavia from Scotland, from Ireland, but it was the Scandinavian ones who came to New Zealand and um, with some other people invented this extraordinary thing called a portable sawmill. And with this portable sawmill, they set about cutting, out, cutting down the native forests of New Zealand. And I mean, they did it with the very best intentions to make a new life for their family and with no understanding of the impact that it would have on the ecosystem or on the indigenous peoples of New Zealand. But it has had a devastating impact and it carries on today. And because I didn't want to leave out the other sentient beings, um, this, is a, this is actually not a very recent figure. 80,000 animals died in the, the first few days, actually, after the, uh, the oil spill into the Mexican Gulf. Um, and this continues to go on. So, no lack of suffering. There's not going to be any problem for us to figure out where might we engage. Um, 
And then there's a whole section of my presentation which isn't up there. <laughs> so I'm just going to speak to that. Uh, so the, the, the next piece for me is, okay, there's suffering. But if we're going to say that practice isn't enough to end suffering, then we have to say, what do we mean by practice? And I think what I mean, and obviously we're being a little bit um, purposefully... Um, uh, I don't know what the word is like, <laughs> provocative with that, because the point is, of course, practice is enough if we have a broad enough understanding of what we mean by practice. But practice isn't enough if our practice is solely focused on ourselves. And so practice for the sake of um, personal transformation, practice for the sake of laying down more of those pathways of peace, of satisfaction, of love and connection, is the foundation of any kind of effective, sustainable, conscious engagement in a world of suffering. But it's not going to be enough. Our practice has to be about more than us. And there's a great uh, piece that the Reverend Danny Fisher, who I think many of you know, uh, wrote very recently, which basically, in which he said, my practice is not just about me. Your practice is not just about you. Um, and in that piece, he was referring to another uh, piece that was written recently, which I found really um, engaging and I hope will stimulate a lot of discussion and debate in Buddhist circles, which was a piece in, in the Huffington Post called Beyond McMindfulness, which I'm going to refer to again soon. Um, <laughs> But you know that when His Holiness the Dalai Lama was asked, what should we do? Like, what is, what, is, what is it that we do when we see that there is a need to act? And he said, well, if you can, you help people. If you can, you help people. It's really that simple. If you can, you help people. And if you can't, then you, you do not harm them. And that sounds very simple. That piece, the second piece, to not do harm, is actually very complex. And I know that many of you are engaged deeply in the investigation of what it means to mean a life that does no harm and what that means in terms of what we consume and what we don't consume, what it means in terms of what we do and what we don't do. Um, but So I'm going to go on. I have no idea what's coming next because I haven't seen this version for a little while. Um, <laughs> there is a, a, another image there I just wanted to kind of uh, remind us. In the context of this, that's actually a photo from inside uh, a juvenile justice system in this country. I mean, this is, and I don't, I'm just throwing this out there, but you know it costs this country, the taxpayers of this country, up to $250,000 a year to keep one of those young men in that facility. I mean, we could put them through Harvard, seriously, for what it keeps cost to keep them in there for one year. So, I mean, the system stinks. What are we going to do about it? What's happening? Okay, so who, let's, let's take an example, a role model. <laughs> Somebody who we've all heard of, who clearly had a deep, engaged practice for personal transformation, but who also got engaged in social change. The Buddha ordained untouchables, which was unthinkable, in the strict social caste system at the time, ordained a serial killer. So we're thinking about our justice system, we're thinking about restorative justice, and ordained women. <laughs> nice. And was committed to doing what he could to avoid replicating that deeply oppressive social caste system within the monastic order. It wasn't perfect, and this is part of what we'll have to learn when we get engaged. Our solutions won't be perfect, and they certainly won't bring about the results that we hope for them immediately, but we still act. Another well-known role model in the Buddhist tradition, uh, Emperor Ashoka established vegetarianism, abolished hunting, um, and I think this is really significant, got involved in the process of creating policies that would protect both the dignity of humans and the planet. And I mention this because, again, practice begins with that inner personal transformation. It is our commitment to an ongoing path of contemplative practice that brings about within us the skills necessary to engage in social change. But it's not enough, and we have to take those skills out to do what we can to end suffering in the world. Where am I going next? Faustian bargain. Oh, this is the wonderful Beyond McMindfulness. And I love this. They say, this is what they said. If we decontextualize mindfulness, so if we decontextualize the, the contemplative practice from its original liberative and transformative purpose, as well as its foundation in social ethics, what we're, what we're 
are making there is a Faustian bargain. We're selling the soul of our practice. I want to come back to the fact, though, that the foundation does have to be practiced. My story, the story in the book of Zen Under Fire, is the story of engagement without practice. And it's a story of overwhelm, depression, burnout, despair, and apathy. So I'm certainly not suggesting get engaged without the foundation of that in a, in a transformative practice. What we know is that practice, as we heard very eloquently last night, will build our resilience. It will give us the mental and emotional resilience to engage in a sustainable, effective way in a world of suffering. So we start with that foundation. But what doesn't practice give us? Practice doesn't give us the information that we need to conduct an effective social critique. It gives us the capacity, it certainly increases our faculty for effective and discerning clear seeing of what's in front of us, but we have to go out and get the information. It doesn't give us the networks and alliances that we need to bring about social change. It does cultivate in us the capacity to create healthy connections and to build effective functioning networks, but we have to go out and build those networks. And this is again from Ron Purser and David Loy, where they use this phrase, colonizing mindfulness, which is, if we, if we take the mindfulness practice, and orient it to the needs of the market, which is what Saikyo Rinpoche talked about. I think it's what he talked about when he said that um, the goal, the vow, is not to, re to achieve grandmaster samsara level. Like We are not here to achieve comfort through equanimity. If you get there, he said, it's time to upgrade the operating system. Right? It's time to look again at the framework in which you've placed your practice. Because if you don't place it in the framework of reflection on the causes of our collective suffering, maybe we run the risk of colonizing mindfulness. Another way of saying it, absent a sharp social critique, Buddhist practices could easily be used to justify and stabilize the status quo. That's your grandmaster samsara. Me, I feel comfortable. What happens then? You reinforce the existing system. And I'm sorry, but I'm going to tell you, the system stinks. So uh, this one, my friend. <laughs> one, of my, one of my friends. And, and what I want to say about this is, what are we going to do about this? I've shown you a couple of places where suffering existed. I could have shown you hundreds of others. The point is, and I believe this is the, the, this is the path of the, Buddhist, of the Buddhist practice, is notice where... Suffering touches your heart most. And that's the place to start. Because then we start from a place of heartfelt intention. Then we start from that place of compassion. So start, choose the place that touches you. Use your practice. Engage in your practice around that heartfelt uh, sense of compassion to find space. That's the not knowing. That's the curiosity of the Buddha path. And to get clear, to see what's really happening and then engage in loving action. What kind of action? Well, I'm a lawyer, so I engage in, you know, I go into prisons and I engage there. This guy, he's a comedian, right? So he engages from where his skill set is. He engages from where his passion is. He does what he's good at. And so I want to encourage you, don't feel like you have to go and do, engage from somebody else's path or somebody else's skill set. If you're a programmer, engage from that. You know, if you're, if you're a fantastic writer, use those skills. But find the thing that touches you, get clear, get grounded in the resilience that comes from your practice, and then act. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Lee.